In this section, we'll be using the goodness of fit test to see whether observed data match the expected values that we would expect to see for a data set. This sounds a little bit more complicated than it is. This will follow the exact same steps that we've been using for all of our hypothesis tests, so let's go ahead and run through those one more time. Um, as a side note, with this goodness of fit test, it's also called a chi-squared distribution test, and we'll use that as our critical value when it gets a little bit closer. So let's go ahead and look at the steps involved in the goodness of fit test. Well, they're all the same as they always have been. The first one is to state HO and HA. The second, we will go ahead and look at our level of significance, and that's always provided to you in the problem. And this is, of course, our value of alpha. Our third step, now, of course, there's going to be a little bit of a difference here whether we're looking at a critical value or a p-value. Either way, we have to calculate a test statistic. And then, of course, once we have our test statistic, we look at our p-value. We make a decision. And then, of course, a summary. Now, this is if we're using the p-value approach. So this is for the p-value approach. Now, a lot of the problems in this homework set ask you for the p-value and also for a critical value. And even though they ask us to find both and we can easily find both, you're not out actually asked to use both. And you'll see that when we run into a little bit of a problem here. So let's go ahead and look at the steps for our traditional approach. And this is also our critical value approach. So one, state HO and HA. Of course, we still need our level of significance, which is alpha. And then based on this level of significance, we find a critical value. Then we calculate our test statistic. And then based on our test statistic, we'll make some sort of a decision. And then summarize. So the only difference here basically is in my traditional or critical value approach, I need to find a critical value, and in my p-value approach, I find a p-value to help me make that decision. Well, one of the things that we have in common here for both of these is the test statistics. So whether it's step three or step four, we need to be able to find a test statistic. So for this particular test, our test statistic is a chi-square test. This is the Greek letter chi, kind of looks like an X with a hanger on it. So chi squared, and chi squared is equal to the sum of the observed values minus the expected values squared. So I'm going to take observed minus expected, square it, add them all up, and then when I'm all done, with each observed minus expected quantity squared, I will divide by expected. Now, that's for each of the possible outcomes. Now, this looks a little bit more complicated than it actually is, but as we get closer, uh, we'll kind of show you what this means. So this is our test statistic. Now, sometimes we'll be asked to find a critical value. To find a critical value, what we're actually looking at is our chi-squared tables. Now, our chi-squared tables have a different shape than our normal tables. So first of all, let's go ahead and look at our My Math Lab. Now mine's gonna look a little different than yours, but down the left-hand side here, you're going to see a tab that says Tables. If you click on Tables, you'll see one that's here for the chi-square distribution. And as this pops up, you'll see that we have down the left-hand side degrees of freedom and then you'll see across the top we have different levels of significance. So this is the table that you'll want to have. Down here it talks about degrees of freedom. We're looking at the goodness of fit, and we just take the number of categories minus one. So that's our degrees of freedom that we'll be using here. Now here, these are our alpha levels across the top, basically. So if we have an alpha of 0.05, I would run down 0.05 to the number of degrees of freedom, 0.025, etc. So the chi-square distribution is always listed here in my math lab. You are also given a copy in class. 
and you'll given, be given a copy on the exams as well. Um, back one step, we also can use our calculator program. So if you look under your calculator, if you look under stat test, hopefully this will come up here in a second. Okay, so stat tests, and if you scroll through here, most of you will have a chi-square GOF stands for goodness of fit test on your calculator. Now if you don't have this option, you're going to need to program it in using your program button, just like you did with the um, T distribution, the inverse T. And you can find the directions for that here in my math lab under calculator programs. So you'd click on calculator programs and you'd go under the how to program chi-square goodness of fit on the TI-83. Now once you open this, there's step-by-step -step instructions and also an example but there's also a nice little link to a video uh, that somebody created on YouTube that you can watch the video and help learn to program these. And they also have an example here as well if you want to follow through. So whether you have it on your calculator or whether you can program it in, it's going to be important to be able to find that p-value. Okay, so the chi-squared distribution, back to that, we look at our chi-squared tables. So to find our critical value, we need to know degrees of freedom and that's going to equal to the number of categories minus one and we also need to know our level of significance alpha. Now when we talk about critical values for the chi-square distribution we're not looking at a nice symmetric distribution like we used to for the normal distribution. This is one of the many chi-square shapes, but the chi-square distribution is really right skewed unless we have really, really small degrees of freedom. And then what ends up happening here is it's um, almost curved, but it's not symmetric. So when we find our critical value, I'm basically finding the value that splits the fail to reject part of the curve and then the reject part of the curve. So this is reject HO, over here is fail to reject HO. So basically our decision when I'm using the critical value approach is you'll reject HO if the test statistic See if I can spell statistic right here. S T A T I S T I C. This test statistic is greater than the critical value. And of course, then once you make that decision, then you can say reject, fail to reject, of course, and then also our summary from there. Now, when we're using the p-value approach, of course, with the p-value, we already know we reject HO if p is less than or equal to alpha, fail to reject HO if p is greater than alpha. So none of those have changed from our other values that we've done before. So for here, we reject HO if p is less than or equal to alpha, and fail to reject HO if p is greater than alpha. Okay. So, same rules as we've always done on that one. Now there's some assumptions too and requirements that I have to know in order to, to perform this test. So let's look at the requirements of the chi-square goodness of fit test. So requirements are, first of all, data is randomly selected. And this is a good requirement for all the tests that we do. If it's not randomly selected, then it's probably a biased sample. So data is randomly selected. Second step, data is found for each category. So there is data in each category. And this will make more sense when we see some examples, but basically, if I'm looking at outcomes for the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there's observations in each of those categories, and there's not one day of the week that's blank. 
third expected frequency and this is important because expected and observed frequency are two different things expected frequency for each category is at least five So if I have all these criteria met, and we always assume that they're met for our homework it seems, um, then it's good to use the chi-square test and I can meet the criteria and the test is accurate. So I think to go ahead and get started, we want to look at an example. So for this example, we're going to be working this problem by hand and with your calculator, and it's good to know both methods. So for this problem, it says conduct the hypothesis test and provide the test statistic, critical value, and p-value and state the conclusion. Now the interesting part of this is this. I'm asked for a critical value and a p-value. You don't actually need to know both of these in order to perform the test, um, but they're asking you to find both of these to see if you know how to find them. So I could either use just the critical value or just the p-value. Okay, so for this example, it says a person drilled a hole in a dice and filled it with a lead weight and proceeded to roll it 200 times. Here are the observed frequencies for the outcomes. So for the outcomes of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, which you would expect to see on the sides of a dice, then they saw 26 out of the 200 were a 1, 28 out of the 200 were a 2, etc. Now if you notice, these aren't really evenly spaced. You'd expect to see about the same number. Now it's not strange that we'd see 26 and 28, but the number 44 does seem quite different from the others. It says use a .025 significance level to test the claim that the outcomes are not equally likely. Uh, does it appear the dice is loaded? And so we'll talk about what that means here in a moment as well. So first of all, we want to start and we want to look at this table. So first of all, we have our outcomes. So for our outcomes, that's what we get when we roll the dice. We can get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Now, when we create our tables, it's usually good to have observed and expected in this order. Now, the reason I say that is when we go to use the test on your calculator, so if you go to Stat, Tests, uh, Goodness of Fit Test, what it asks us for first is the observed and the expected. So this is a really good habit to get into is to keep in that order. And we will get to use the calculator here in just a bit. So first of all, here's our observed values. So our observed values are 26, 28, 44, 38, 27, and 37. Now if we were to total these up, we would get 200. Now, if it's a fair die, that would mean I would expect to see a 1 the same as amount of times as I'd see a 2 and the same amount of time as I'd see a 3, 4, 5, and 6. So the probability for rolling a 1 is 1 6. So for my expected outcomes here, because these are equally likely, so let's go ahead and note that these are equally likely. I'll note that in a second, actually. I am looking at... 200 outcomes and one-sixth of those, so 200 times one-sixth should be equal to the roll of a die of a 1, a 2, 3, 4, 5, and a 6. So this is basically 33 and a third. Now we have to be careful about how we round these and so we want to keep this in mind as well. I'm just going to take these out to three decimal places. Now because these are equally likely, all of these outcomes are the same. I have no idea why I put a 7 there. That's a 3. Now if we added these up, we're not going to get exactly 200 uh, because we'll have a little bit of rounding error there. So if we take 33.333 times 6, uh, we get 
which is essentially 200. So we'll say which is approximately 200. Now to find our test statistic, my chi-squared value, remember, was observed minus expected quantity squared all over expected. So that's going to go in this column. So to start filling this out, I would take observed, which is 26, this has to be in parentheses, minus expected 33.333, this is quantity squared, divided by expected, so that's my expected value is 33.333. So for my first one, if I round this to three places, this would be 1.613. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down the list and I'm going to do this again for the 28 observation. So the 28 minus 33.333. So in parentheses, 28 minus 33.333 squared divided by 33.333. Now there's more than one way to do this problem. Um, this is kind of just following through from doing actual counts. So let's pop that calculator, 0 0.853, so this is from here. So go ahead and pause the video if you would like and finish filling out this table. Okay, so for here you can see I went through and I did the observations and totaled um, each of those up. And if I add these up, I get 8.139. This is my test statistic. So creating a table to find these makes it work really nice. So for our example, the test statistic is chi squared equals 8.139. Okay, so now I can start running through the actual steps in testing the hypothesis. And what is the hypothesis? We're going to check that out here in just a minute. So first, state HO and HA. So for this example, I'm looking at the outcomes of rolling a dice, and if it's a fair die, then all of the outcomes should be the same, or the, all the outcomes should be equally likely. You can also think about this as the proportions or the probabilities. So the probability of rolling a 1 is the same as the probability of rolling a 2, is the same as the probability of rolling a 3, a 4, a 5, and a 6. So this is sometimes how you would see that written. You know, the alternative is going to be really different. The alternative is not going to be a mathematical statement, but just a statement in general. Basically, it's going to say at least one of the probabilities. It doesn't say which one or how many of the probabilities. It says at least one of the probabilities is different from the probabilities listed above. And these probabilities listed above are called the expected probabilities. Because it's a fair die, then I would expect each of the probabilities to be the same. So here's an example of how we could state HO and HA for this example. Okay, second step, we need our level of significance. So for this example, our level of significance um, was 0 0.025. Okay, step three we're going to find a critical value. Now for this problem, they asked us to find the critical value and the p-value, so we're going to do that. So kind of just as a side note, we're going to find the critical value. And again, usually you don't find the critical value and the p-value, you just find one of them. So to find the critical value, I need to know two things. I need to know my alpha, which is 0 0.025, and I need to know my degrees of freedom. Well, there's six, six outcomes, so there's k categories, and I subtract one for degrees of freedom, so 6 minus 1 would equal 5. Okay, so I have 5 here. So let's go ahead and find 0 0.025 and 5 degrees of freedom. So we just need the top bit of this table. I don't 
think we need the table to be quite that large. Okay, so the 0.025 is up here. And then we have five degrees of freedom is over here. And we can see that they intersect for a critical value. So this value is our critical value. And we can see that's equal to 12.833. Okay, now for this problem, they also go ask us to find the p-value. So we're still on step three here, and they ask us to calculate the p-value. Well, this is where your calculators are going to come into play. Um, if we want to calculate the p-value, it's really difficult to do just given my tables because it's, they don't list all the possible probabilities. So using our calculator is going to be cru crucial here to find that p-value. So to find the p-value, you'd go to stat, and we need to go to edit, and we're going to put values in our list. So if your lists aren't cleared, go ahead and clear those out by going to the top L1 and L2, hitting clear and enter. Now we need our observed and our expected values. So let's go ahead and scroll up to that table, and let's look at those observed and expected values. Now remember, for our first list, L1, we need to make sure that we can see the um, observed in our first column. So we'll have 26, and again, these are my observed, 28, 44, 38, 27, and 37. Now if I wanted to, I could also go through here and I could put in as these as proportions, and I could have left these as decimals, one divided by six. So I can actually look at actual counts or probabilities. Okay, so for L2 would be my expected. Since they're equally likely, these are all the same. Okay, and so now let's go to stat, tests, now, if you have your goodness of fit, it'll be listed here. You might have to scroll through. If you don't have your goodness of fit, remember you have to program that in. So here's my chi-squared goodness of fit test. Now remember, my observed were already in L1 and my expected were in L2. My degrees of freedom is five because I had a roll of six on my dice and it's six minus one is five for my degrees of freedom. And let's go ahead and go to calculate here and see what it gives me for summary values. Okay, now if you notice, it's kind of giving me a, um, quite a bit of information here. So let's go ahead and look at what that information is. First of all, this is my test statistic, this chi-squared value, 8.140. If I can compare that over here with what I found, 8.139, you can see how close those are. The second value is important here. This is my p-value. My p-value is 0.1487 uh, if we round. Our degrees of freedom are five. And this we don't really need to worry so much about. Um, we won't be looking at this last bit of information here. So the, the information we want are these first two things, really. So let's go ahead and paste those into our notes. And degrees of freedom of five, we already knew that, but we'll put that in as well. And that's where my p-value is. Now it doesn't give me a critical value. I have to find that for my tables, but it does give me my p-value. Now we have to also be very careful here um, that you don't have to find the chi-square critical value and the p-value. This question just has, happens to ask us for both. Okay, so once we know our p-value, and of course our p-value is listed right here, then we can go ahead and I think we messed up my steps here. Sorry about that. Let's look again. So here's our critical value. We need our test statistic in here. So let's sneak in our test statistic. So we were at step three for critical value. 
So step three of my other, and I know this gets confusing, but for some reason my math lab asks us for both critical value and p-value. We kind of have a 3a here, I guess we could say, is our test statistic. Now our test statistic we already calculated up above. That was that chi-squared value, and I think we have, what, 8.139 as our test statistic. So sorry about the mix-up here in the steps. Uh, for some reason, in my math lab, they ask us for both these pieces of information. So once we have our test statistic, our chi-squared value, then I can come down here and calculate my p-value. So we'll call this 4. Okay, and then I can go ahead and look at making a decision. Now in order to make a decision, I'm going to observe a couple things. First of all, p was 0 0.1487. Alpha was 0 0.025 for this example. Okay, now p is greater than alpha. Therefore, we'll fail to reject HO. Now, if I fail to reject HO, basically, on my chi-squared distribution, and this question might come up in my math lab, remember that critical value was 12.833. Our test statistic was the 8. 139 or um, 8.140 based on our calculator, but you can see how close these are. So basically, our test statistic 8.139, 8.139 is in the fail to reject region. Okay, so this is our critical value, this is our test stat. Now, the two things that we're looking at here, then, if it comes up in my math lab, even though they're asking questions about the critical value, you don't really have to find it. You can just do it based on the p-value. We could just look at this and say, oh, our test statistic was not more extreme than the critical value. I had to fail to reject. So if your p-value says fail to reject, that also tells me that my test statistic was less than my critical value by default. Okay, let's go ahead and look at step six, our summary. And there's a lot of different ways we can write our summary. But basically, if we fail to reject HO, let's go look at HO again. If we fail to reject HO, it says the proportions are all the same. This is basically a fair die. And this is what we would call a loaded die because the proportions are not the same. So if we fail to reject this, we're basically saying, you know what, this looks like it's still a fair die. So let's go ahead and write this summary. Um, we decided to fail to reject or do not reject HO. There is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the outcomes are not equally likely. That was our alternative hypothesis. We don't have any support for the alternative. So what we are saying here are the outcomes appear to be equally likely. So the loaded die does not appear to behave differently from a fair die. So even though we went through the process of drilling out this dice and adding weight to one side or the other to make it roll differently, it's not really rolling any differently at all. Um, the numbers kind of looked like they were significantly different, but when we ran through the test, it says, you know what, even though it's different, it's not different enough in order for me to say that it's no longer a fair die. 
So there's quite a bit of information that we went through here. Now remember, one of the things I really want you to keep in mind is even though this problem asked me for a critical value and a p-value, you really don't need both. You can either do one method or the other. This problem just happened to ask for both pieces of information. Let's go ahead and look at another example. Okay, for our next example, uh, wait, one thing that we forgot to talk about. Let's scroll up here real quick. We did mention this, but I forgot to write anything on our notes. Um, this expected, let's put an asterisk here. So for those expected, there was an outcome here of 200 possibilities. And since this is a fair die, we expected those to be 1 6 probability. So 200 times 1 6 was 33.3 repeating. And I just rounded this to three places. So that's where the expected values came from. Remember, if it's a fair die, the probability is 1 6 because there's six different outcomes. Now, we could also kind of run through that same idea. If there was seven days in a week and we are assuming equally likely outcomes, the probability of something occurring on any one of those days would be one out of seven. Uh, this would also work if there was 12 months in a year and we were looking at the outcomes and they were saying they're equally likely or we're testing to see if they're equally likely, that would be one divided by seven. Or sorry, one divided by 12 because they're months in a year. So again, keep that in mind. So this was example days in a week, one out of seven, uh, fair die with six possible outcomes was one out of six, and months in a year would be one out of 12. So it's important to keep that in mind if we're talking about equally likely. Okay, for this next example, we are not expecting equally likely outcomes. We're, giving, we're being given a list of possible outcomes and their corresponding probabilities, and they're not equal. Okay, for this example, we have a table below that provide the number of games of World Series contests along with the expected proportions with teams of equal abilities. So this proportion list right here is assuming that the teams have equal abilities. There's not one that has an advantage over the other. It says use an alpha level of 5% level of significance to test the claim that the observed frequencies agree with the theoretical proportions. So if you notice, these are all different. We're not assuming that they're the same like we did for our last problem. We're assuming they're different. Okay, last question here. Does there appear to be enough evidence to support the claim that the seven game series occur more often than expected? So this is kind of getting to the idea of um, if the seven game series ex that occurs more often than we would expect it to occur, why is that? Um, why are the games going to seven games when we wouldn't expect them to is that often? There could be a lot of different reasons for this. One reason could be that um, the teams are not equally balanced. One team is significantly better or worse than the other. Um, there also could be the idea of um, the teams make more money, the television uh, stations make more money, etc. if the games go into seven series or seven games. And so those are a couple of different things that come to mind. Now before we can really get started, I need observed and expected outcomes. So first of all, the actual frequency is our observed. So we can start making some notes on this table. So these are our observed outcomes in the number of series that we watched. Now there can't be zero games in the series. That would mean we didn't play. There can't be one game in the series because you have to win four out of the seven games in order for this to occur. Uh, so the fewest number of games that can be played and win the win World Series is four. So that's why we start here at four and go up to seven. So these are my observed counts. Now this is my expected probability. I need my expected frequency. Because when we're going to do this on our calculators, we need counts, we don't need probabilities. So the first thing we need to do is to total the total number of observations or the total number of years that I made uh, created this data for. So let's go ahead and add up the 17 plus 19 plus 20 plus 37. So 93 years or 93 series I've watched here. Not 93 games, but 93 series. So this is my sample size. Now a couple of things to keep in mind here. These expected probabilities, these were calculated and given to us and these would be used to assume teams of equal abilities. Now if you added up these four fractions, 3 16ths plus 4 16ths 
plus 5 sixteenths plus 4 sixteenths, this would total 1. And that's important uh, because all of the number of possibilities are listed here, so the probabilities have to sum to 1. So in order to p for me to find my expected value, I need n times p. So here my expected count would be 93 times 3 sixteenths. My expected count here would be 93 times 4 sixteenths. Here would be 93 times 5 sixteenths. And here would be 93 times 4 sixteenths again. And these would be my observed values. So let's go ahead and pull up our calculator and calculate these. So our first one, if we scroll across here, would be 93 times 3 sixteenths. And if you want to put 3 sixteenths in parentheses, you can. But I get 17.4375. And I'm going to go ahead and carry that out all the decimal places that we have there. Next would be 93 times 4 sixteenths. And again, you can put the 4 sixteenths in parentheses. Now, 4 sixteenths reduces to 1 fourth, um, but they leave it as sixteenths here, so they have common denominator. So this is 23.25, and that's going to be the same as this one down here. And then 93 times 5 sixteenths. And again, if you want to put the 5 sixteenths in parentheses, you can. We get 29.0625. Okay, so now we want to go ahead and figure out how to use our calculators to help us out here. Now we could keep doing this by hand, observe minus expected quantity squared divided by expected and go ahead and create this table, or we can go ahead and put these values into our calculator. So to start adding these to your calculator, you go to Stat, Edit, and down your first column are your observed values. So these would be the values of the 17, 19, 20, and 37. So 17, 19, 20, and 37. And then directly across from the 17 has to go with the expected. So I have 17.4375. And if you notice up here, my calculator um, rounded that to 17.438. Then you can see my other values is here as well. Then we'd go to stat, tests, and then go to chi-squared goodness of fit. Now if you had to program the chi-squared goodness of fit into your calculator, you'd go under program to find the same thing. So chi-squared goodness of fit either under stat tests or under program depending on whether your calculator had it originally. My observed values are in L1, my expected are in L2, degrees of freedom are 3, because I have four categories here, so four categories minus one would be three degrees of freedom. And then we go to calculate. And then here's basically everything I need. Now it gives me my test statistic and it gives me my p-value and my degrees of freedom. And again, that last thing we don't really concern ourselves with right now. So we have a lot of information here, so I think before we even paste that in, we need to start with our null and our alternative hypothesis. So one, step one, HO versus HA. Now for this one, I'm not saying the proportions are equal. What I'm trying to get at here is the proportions are as they're expected or not. So here we talk about something about the observed frequencies. So the observed frequencies of the World Series games agree with the theoretical proportions. Okay, and then of course the alternative would be the observed frequencies. Do not agree. the theoretical proportions. Okay, so that's the first step. Second step, we want our level of significance. 
And for this one, let's go ahead and scroll up and check that out again. 0.05, we can see that that's right up here. So 5% level of significance. Now if I wanted to use a critical value approach, I could. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and use the information that my calculator gave me. And it gave me that my test statistic was equal to 11.745. 11 or 746 if we wanted to go ahead and round it. So this is my test statistic. So my test statistic is chi squared equal 11.746. Step four, go ahead and calculate the p-value. Well, that was also given to me as well. My p-value here is very small, 0.0083. And we want to make a decision. In order for me to make a decision, I need to know my p-value. And I need to know my level of significance, which is 0 0.05. And here, I have p is definitely less than or equal to alpha. Therefore, we would reject HO. Okay. Step six, we would summarize. Now, there's a lot of different ways that we can summarize, but basically, we would say uh, there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the observed frequencies Do not, okay, so again, this is important, do not agree with the theoretical proportions. Theoretical, it almost looks like an A there. Let's make sure it's an O, so theoretical is spelled correctly. So, let's try that again. Maybe theoretical was spelled right. I think I had the word the and theoretical combined here. So, agree with the theoretical proportions. So what that's getting after then is there's something going on. Either the games or either the teams are not equally likely to win, meaning they're not evenly matched, or we could go after something like, you know, maybe because of pressures with making money and stuff for the teams, they're trying to extend out and make them run a lot longer, make the games run a lot longer than usual. So it doesn't say why they're different, it just says they are different. So using your calculator will be pretty straightforward here, and again, if your calculator doesn't have that, you can program it in. But remember, observed is your first column, theoretical is your second column, and then you can work forward from there. If you have any questions, as usual, please bring them to class. You can also stop by my office or stop by the math uh, center as well in the library. Good luck on this assignment.